All right, welcome back to another episode of Phoenix Edge. This is an RPG and gaming news podcast. My name is Hat. And I am Stan. And today we are going to be diving into your community slash Discord questions. If you're unaware, we do have a Discord. There'll be a link in the description. Our listeners and viewers go onto our Discord. They ask us questions. And from time to time, we will devote an entire episode to answering your biggest RPG questions. So today we have from Shatera. If you were a kid again with a three-month summer break and could only have one JRPG to last you through it, which would you choose and why? So Tara does have some extra context there, which we'll get into for the question. Then next up, we have from Luke Sky Watson, who says, what is your favorite JRPG cast of characters? And then we have from Hyconic, who asks, which RPG franchises do you think are good, but flying under the radar? And then last but not least, we have from Zack Attack, who says, What's an RPG series you haven't played yet? For those series, is there a plan to play them in the future? If not, why not? But let's keep this podcast rolling and let's move on to Luke Sky Watson. His question is, what is your favorite JRPG cast of characters? Yep. Stan, what do you got? You know, this is a surprisingly simple question. Like, you, what's your favorite cast of characters? But then I was thinking about it, and I was like, this is hard. <laughs> really? Okay. Like, I got to I gotta pick one. Um, I picked two, but I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I picked my favorite one, and then I was like, well, I also like these, but here's why they're not number one. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah. Well, if, I'm, if I set the Final Fantasy games aside, um, for okay. me, it's, it's, it's an easy choice. Um, Tales of the Abyss has my favorite. Oh, wow. Okay. Party. And, and part of that is just because, um, the main character, uh, Luke is my favorite, um, protagonist, JRPG protagonist from a, from a non FF game standpoint. Right. He's a very, very memorable character. Um, he starts off the game as like a total jerk, um, spoiled brat, essentially very pampered and protected. I like isolated from real world problems. And, the other characters are just basically just reacting to him <laughs> the whole game, but they have their own personalities. And so you learn more about them based on how they react with, to him and deal with him. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a good dynamic for the whole game basically. Um, but if I include the final fantasy games, my, my favorite cast of characters are actually in those games. And I used to say final fantasy seven, was like my was like it was like an easy pick. It was like Final Fantasy VII. Those characters are so iconic, like and except Kate Sith, except Kate Sith. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But now, and this may be just because I'm kind of uh, chomping at the bit to replay the game. I'm I'm leaning towards Final Fantasy X, just because I think the all the characters are like have a. A, like a role in the party kind of from beginning to end. Like none of them really fall, fall off. Mm. Although I guess you could say maybe um, like towards the end, Lulu is kind of uh, doesn't have all that much going on. And also Kimari is like always just kind of in the background. <laughs> he's cause he's like the, he's like the silent, but dependable kind of, kind of guy. Well, I think that, um, I think that, Final Fantasy X's characters, when you're talking about Lulu, for example, she's one of those supporting cast members that Mm -hmm. sometimes these games will get criticized because they'll say, oh, the game, you know, just Final Fantasy games in general or JRPGs in general, I should say, you know, the game only focuses on these three characters mainly. And then these other ones are, there's not as much, right? And Mm -hmm. I kind of, I've always looked at that as kind of a weird thing to say because the game would feel crowded if they spent 12 hours on on lulu i mean the reason she's in the story is to support the other characters and their narrative right so lulu right. gives a lot of context to titus and how letting him know the world but she also adds a lot of insight into waka's character as well which yes. i think is yeah. really important yeah she definitely serves a purpose i think yeah and she's kind of like in this um like mentor role char- mm-hmm. character role where where Titus doesn't know anything. And so she's always having to explain to him like how our world works. Yeah. It's just at the kind of at the last chapter of the story, when Titus has decided, well, things need to change and 
and and by the point where yuna actually agrees with him and is like yeah let's no longer follow these traditions at that point lulu doesn't have much of a mm. role to play in the story because her previous role is no longer necessary yeah and so she's just it feels like she's just kind of there for the last part because she's been there the whole time yeah that's the only thing she does have like a little mini chapter like optional dungeon that you can do learn more about her backstory but it's it's that's pretty short but overall yeah i feel like the cast everyone is relevant i think for most of the game from when you meet them to to the end yeah i totally agree i I was thinking about this game a lot over the weekend because if anyone's familiar with the youtube channel alleyway jack we had him on our podcast to talk about final fantasy 15 or 16 i should say right Mm -hmm. final fantasy 16 16 news and it was a very good podcast episode go check that out go check out his youtube channel but he was posting that he was replaying final fantasy 10 on twitter and he said that final fantasy 10 on this replay is starting to exceed final fantasy 7 for him which is a big statement Ooh, yeah i mean he's it's not get too crazy because he is a big final <laughs> fantasy 8 guy and which, 7 as well i think right yeah he did oh, a, a lot of stuff fantasy, on 7 yeah uh, 7 as well but i always enjoy his videos on final fantasy 8 because i'm not the biggest final fantasy 8 fan and he just goes full ham on these games and it kind mm. of adds a new layer to my appreciation for the game. But back to Final Fantasy X, he was posting on there about, you know, his kind of initial feelings with Final Fantasy X as he's going through it again. And it was making me think about the game a lot and that, you know, that that game, despite all the cheese, despite all the the laugh, you know, that everyone talks about with Titus and how it's corny, the, despite the fact that Riku can be a little over the top sometimes and just kind of too anime and giddy and just kind of annoying, that cast of characters, they just work. And mm-hmm. it, like their stories all intertwine with like a singular theme, right? The, the, like I can't imagine Final Fantasy X without Riku because Riku is the, the central character that changes Waka's view on the outbed, right? Without Riku, you would not have that. And so, you know, and the same thing can go with all the other characters as well. So I just, they did a really good job with that. I agree. Yeah. R- Riku in particular, um, because also she's the last character to, to join the group. Yeah. So the, the whole beginning of the game, you just have um, Titus kind of questioning things, but I mean, he's a fish out of water. He has to, he has to go with let's, the flow essentially. Right. Let's say Titus, huh? Titus, yes. I actually prefer Titus, and I've just gotten used to saying it. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I yeah, yeah. checked for no reason at all. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but then um so yeah, it's it's kind of Titus with Yuna and Lulu, who's constantly telling him this is how things happen and this is how that the reason they are the way they are, and it's what we have to do. And he's kind of rebelling, like he's saying, like, oh, you know, screw the traditions, like this doesn't make sense to me. But he's kind of like kept in check because he respects Yuna and like what she's trying to do. But then Riku joins and she's like, no, this is kind of dumb. Like we shouldn't be doing this, you know, like this, this doesn't make sense. Or like, you know, like Yevon is full of it essentially. (laughs) And then it kind of gives Titus more leeway to, I think, break, yeah, yeah, break, break out of the traditions because um, there's someone else who, who's uh, more closer to his, uh, like temperament and uh, like worldview of like, no, this, these, a lot of this doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it, if Titus was the only source of conflict to their belief, it, it, I don't think it would be as powerful. Right. So the fact that the all bed exists, mm-hmm. you know, kind of really fleshes that out a lot more, I think. Yeah. And of course they're, they are shunned as the unbelievers. You can't, uh, can't trust anything. They, although they're still allowed to participate like in the blitz ball tournament. Well, I mean, it's sports, you know, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There, there, there there are some plot holes with that game where you're kind of like, I guess you could kind of, you know, head cannon your way around this, but you know, with the Luca stadium, there seems to be a lot of technology at that stadium, even Mm -hmm. though we don't like technology. But apparently, Yevon allows it because it raises people's experience, uh, spirits. And I'm like, mm, I feel like Sin would attack this place immediately, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. But 
overall, it's a, it's a, it's a great game, and it's just such a classic that if you have not played, you are missing out. Don't let the laugh, the famous Titus laugh, fool meme, you. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the other cheesy scenes. There's a lot more in there. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're talking about Oren in particular, I mean, he's just... That's one of those games where when you do replay the game, his character quickly becomes your favorite because he's... Oh, yeah. On your first playthrough, you're identifying with Titus because you don't know anything about this world. You don't know anything. And then on your second playthrough, you're identifying with Oren mm -hmm. because Oren's already been through all this and so have you. And so it creates a totally new context, everything that's going on. So yeah, great, great pick. Fantastic pick. I would have to say for me personally, my very favorite is Final Fantasy IX. I don't think that's going to surprise that many people. That is my favorite Final Fantasy. But I just think that that was the cast of characters where they just nailed it. I mean, they, they nailed it with Final Fantasy X as well. But I think Final Fantasy IX, that was the first time where I was just, I felt good with all of the characters. And, mm -hmm. you know, all the other games, they, they kind of have a character that I almost despise. You know, mm -hmm. with Final Fantasy VII, you had Kate Sith, Final Fantasy VIII, Depending on who you ask, everyone's got one, whether it's Zell or <laughs> Selfie or Quizzes. Yeah, yeah. Some people don't like Renoa. Some people don't like Squall, the main character. Some people like all of them. I'll acknowledge that. But, and we can go back and you, plenty of haters on Final Fantasy VI, some of the extra characters you don't really use and all that other stuff. But I think Final Fantasy IX, I, I like all the characters in that game. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that all of their stories are as complete as the main cast, meaning Zidane, Steiner, Garnet, and Vivi, those four characters are easily the best and most well-developed. Mm -hmm. But similar to what we we're talking about with Lulu, I think the other three characters being Freya, Kina, and Amaranth, those three characters, while they're not as fully developed, they are there for a story purpose. They allow us to see different sides to our main cast in a way that I think is really important. I know people are going to bring up Amaranth, that he's not as good as the other characters. And I would agree, but I don't dislike the character. I think mm. every scene yeah. that he's in, every story element that he's in, I think it adds more to the game. It doesn't feel like a chore. He really serves as kind of a an opposite look to Zidane's character, right? Because the whole game's about making your own choice, not letting society tell you who you are, that type of thing. And when you look at Zidane and Amaranth, they had very similar upbringings. They didn't really have family. They kind of were raised by the streets. And both of them went two different directions. And that was because of their choice. And you have a similar dynamic with the other characters, Steiner and Beatrix, similar backgrounds, two different choices, you know, and you have Garnet and Aiko, uh, Vivi and Kina. Freya is kind of the odd one out there, but she already made that decision a long time ago and she regrets it. So you can kind of experience that dynamic as well. And so I just think all the characters work so well together and just the camaraderie among the cast, the 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 banter, the Kina getting married to Vivi, I mean, it's just hysterical. And I, I just love that cast so much. And the amount of character growth that they have over the entire course of the game is just amazing, in particular with Steiner. I mean, look at that guy at the beginning of the game. I can't stand him at the beginning of the game. He's annoying. Yeah. I hate him. <laughs> And by the end of the game, he's just like a beast. I love him, mm -hmm. you know? And he's changed so much. And even with the characters like Beatrix, my God. I mean, she was like frightening at the beginning of the game. And I'm sorry if I'm getting into spoiler territory, I'll stop. But I just want to like, that was just like, it doesn't get much better than Final Fantasy IX, in my opinion. It, I, I and I, you know, I, I just, I, I don't think... I don't think there's many other RPGs that really have such a a likable cast of characters uh, in mm. an RPG. Yeah, that's a great pick. Uh, unsurprising because it's your favorite Final Fantasy nine, uh, Final Fantasy game. Well, but... it is the best one. So, yeah. Well, so they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that is a that is a really good pick. Those are great characters. Yeah. Yeah. And then my other one that I would pick is, I guess I could pick two, but. I really enjoyed the cast in Xenoblade Chronicles. Mm. 
it's, and I'll tell you why it wasn't my, my top pick in a moment, but let me just talk about some of the stuff I did like Shulk and Ryan, the bromance, <laughs> best bromance in any JRPG, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're just like best friends. And I just like every scene with them. And it just, it just feels so natural whenever they're together and just having a good time. And I really don't doubt Ryan's character at all. I always feel like he's there. He's, you know, he's committed and, and vice versa with Shulk and uh, definitely just a fantastic job writing that romance. Right. And then you have Dunban mm. who is just like a cool of the cool, right. When you're talking about some of the coolest JRPG characters, I really think Dunban would be up there with, with for me with like Oren and, you know, freaking i guess i would put cloud in that cool factor although mm -hmm. these days i kind of look at him as a kind of a flawed individual but he is kind of a cool character but dunban's just awesome he really comes across like that mentor character that you know most good stories have but you know he's still got a lot to learn as well but anytime the guy spoke i always felt like he was gonna impart some kind of knowledge to the party and i just wanted to listen so yeah those three characters, I think, were were the best. Fiora was obviously really good. I don't want to talk too more about that because of I'm gonna stop talking. And then, yeah. <laughs> but but the thing that loses me a little bit is when you start drifting away from those characters, you start to lose me a little bit. I think Sharla was okay. I mean, she mm -hmm. had some good scenes, but she wasn't quite as enjoyable to me as the other ones. But she wasn't bad at, by any means. I still had a good time with her. Melia was good startup, but weak resolution. And then when you get down to Ricky, that's where I start tapping. Like <laughs> the, the obligatory mascot character. Ricky! In these, yeah. In these anime <laughs> games. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just, little I think he had some funny, funny moments uh, where you find out like uh, not a huge spoiler, but he's, he's doing this basically because he's like, He's a dad of like 13 kids or something, and he has to <laughs> basically earn a salary that's big enough to support them. And so the way he does that is by being like the hero of the village. Yeah. Tackling all the hardest challenges that they have. <laughs> they all like hate him and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, I don't hate Ricky because he grows on me and he's very endearing in that regard. But he's also just annoying at times. That, yeah. He's that character type that he has. Yeah. Yeah, like if I had to go on like a long road trip with Ricky, he wouldn't make the road trip, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I mean, and, and so that's where it kind of loses me a little bit is with those other characters. And still, like I said, you know, still top tier cast, in my opinion, as far as cast members and JRPGs go. Did a great, great job. So definitely good job with that. Mm -hmm. I would honestly say also Dragon Quest Eleven. Okay. I thought they had a great cast. You know, Eric's backstory with his sister was fantastic. Silvando, he's just the rock of the party. Very yeah. unconventional in a way. You had some great character growth with, with characters like Hendrick, for example, that really had a complete character arc. Rab, the old man, perverted old man. <laughs> Dude, that guy was hilarious. And he was just yeah. so wise at times too, which baffles me that they were able to accomplish that. So uh, that that was yeah. really good as well. So I'll, I'll I could keep going with other games, but yeah, there's there's so many because like JRPGs, that's what they really focus on. Um, most of them, like so many of them, is like your your protagonist and then like the band, you know, the merry group around them, and then yeah. you all go on a journey together, and then right. the fellowship, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So definitely a great question from Luke Sky Watson. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Let's go ahead and get started with Shatera's first question. We're going to dive right into it. And we're going to give a full context of the question here. So Shatera says, many reviewers bemoan the length of main storylines, the overabundance of quests, tedious mini games, and other padding and JRPGs. However, in Japan with the household income on average being lower compared to the U.S., but still having to pay close to the same price, games are expensive, and for many, they can really only afford the one game to last them for a long while. With all that being said, again, if you were a kid again, which, with the three-month summer break, 
with the three month summer break and could only have one JRPG to last you through it, which would you choose and why? So a lot of interesting stuff there. I know, Stan, you said you did a little bit of research on this average income portion of the question or the context to the question. You mm. want to start with that and then go ahead and just go into your game and sure, we'll go from sure. there. Yeah. So, yeah, it, I, I saw the the premise of the question that, um, you know, on average, games are more expensive in Japan and right. average household household income is lower compared to us here. We're in the United States. It's. I'm sure it varies everywhere, but yeah. So quick Google search and a few different sources. Um, it looks like the average disposable income. So after you've paid for like essentials, you okay. know, your, 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 like your rent, your transportation to your job and your groceries and all those things, <laughs> right? The, the average disposable income for Japan is about 13% lower than the US. Hmm. So they have less spending money on average. So obviously there will be individuals that have way more, but also much less. Right, right. You know, it's a bell curve. Yeah. And then um, the average video game in Japan, like a console game, varies between 5,000 to 8,000 yen, which is roughly. Uh, 45, like around $45 to $73 or so. So they're, they're games that cost, our, well, our games that cost the $60, like the brand new $60, for them, a lot of those games are around $73. Wow. So they are more expensive and they do have, on average, 13% less disposable income. So that could... That could explain why a lot of these games are too long, in our opinion, right? They make them and they're, <laughs> they have too much filler content in them. But, but yeah, that, that makes sense with, uh, with the question. So that gives some uh, extra weight to the $70 price tag of next gen games. Right. This, this information I got was from the PS4 generation. I think that data was like from 2016 or 17. So it could be even more. Yeah, yeah. translation of U.S. dollars. I mean, I'm not doing the exchange rate from today in my head, right? But that's probably around eighty dollars they're paying for next gen games. So yeah, that's yeah. And on top of that, they're they're, they're making less money. So man, mm -hmm. definitely definitely some good context there from Chatera on you know if you had to pay that much money, what JRPG would you pick? Yeah. What 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 would be your your pick, Stan? So I was thinking about it and I was thinking like, yeah, you would want a JRPG with a lot of content and a lot of like um, optional or mm -hmm. end game content for your game. If you're looking to make it stretch out for your whole, for your whole summer. So what is that game? I think um, Final Fantasy 12, the remaster, the Zodiac. Oh, Age. wow. I didn't expect that from you. I think that's a good one. It doesn't have as much end game content as like uh, Xenoblade Chronicles. Okay. Definitive edition, which is another one I thought of. Maybe that's the one you get if you just have a switch, right? You're, you're the switch is your console. Right. Right. But the FF 12 remaster is cheaper at this point. So it's not, it's not $60 in most places. So I would hope that it would be cheaper elsewhere as well. Cause it's been out for a few years now. Yeah. And it has a lot of um, cool optional content. You know, you've got like the monster hunts that can be challenging. And if you need to, you can replay the game and respect your characters out like in a different way, you know, like try different strategies and such. I think that's a good pick. I full disclosure. I love Final Fantasy 12. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not a Final Fantasy 12 hater. I am camp Final Fantasy 12. I love that game. It's just a guilty pleasure of mine. I love playing it. And so I like that pick. I do have to put a little asterisk there that the Zodiac version does have a lot of replay value for what you're talking about with the different job class experimentation. I do like that, but I will add that if it's your first time playing and you think, well, this is kind of easy. They did make that game significantly easier than the PlayStation mm -hmm. two version. So 
Yeah. They actually, even the original Zodiac version that only came out in Japan, but for some reason it was the international version that only came out in one country. Very weird. But the original international version added the job class. So the original PS2 version, there was only, you could, it was basically like Final Fantasy VII. You could just build this character that could do everything, right? And so the Zodiac version that originally came out, you had to pick a specific job and just stick with it the entire game. And then the remastered version, they, you know, the big allure of that was now other players around the world can play the Zodiac version and have a job, but they added the ability to choose a second job halfway through the game. So this means that your license grid, which is basically like a sphere grid, kind of, it operates in a similar fashion. That means you get a lot more HP upgrades, a lot more strength upgrades, and they even increased the amount that you get from the original version and gave you more HP upgrades in general. So being an experienced Final Fantasy XII fan, when I went and played the international, or not the international, the remastered Zodiac version, I thought it was just laughably easy because my characters were so overpowered halfway through the game that I had like 7,000 HP and these people are doing like 300 damage. It, it does it does have though like... Um a challenge mode that you can play where it's kind of like a tower and there's like a hundred floors. I think it is with like different fights. Yeah. And then if you beat that challenge, at least on the PS4 version, you can um, play the, you can play the, like the weak mode or the hard mode of the game where your characters don't level up. They're all level one. So all the stats that you get have to come from the license board. And so that might be more of a challenge if you just blow through the game you know, because of the, the easier difficulty. The challenge mode you're talking about, it was available in the original, but you had to acquire the item. I believe I'm, my my memory is going a little blank on this because I didn't actually play that way until I got this new version. Yeah, yeah. There was an item that you had to equip and it made it so you didn't gain any experience. Right. And so people turned it into their own like optional challenge mode, like on game FAQs or you yeah. know, different forums, they said, oh, equip this item on your characters from the very beginning and then try and beat the game without any levels. Right. And, and then that's kind of cool that they, 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 they must have seen that and then they like, oh, it's possible to beat the game with only the license board sets. So then they made that like an official mode Hard that mode. you could yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And so playing the remastered version with an hard mode, effectively, you're not leveling up. You're just relying completely on the stat upgrades but it's totally doable i did it mm -hmm. it's it's not that difficult and it does make the game a lot better in my opinion yep yeah so that's that's a game i think you can get a lot of a lot of content a lot of hours out of that game the and the environments are like very big you know take a long time to traverse and the story is a little more on the political side like less um like interpersonal drama right. between the characters. Although there is some, but it's kind of right. like all resolved within the first 15 to 20 hours. You know, after that, it's kind of very plot driven game. Yeah. So if you're, if you're not into that, maybe Xenoblade Chronicles definitive edition is like a better choice. Cause that's more of like a anime shonen type of story with the characters. So that story is one of the biggest, just heartaches for me in all of JRPGs, because not because it's so overwhelmingly emotional or anything like that. It's just, you know, the first, like you said, 15, 20 hours, they were killing it with the story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As we know, Matsuno was directing that game and in charge of the story. And then Sakaguchi left the company and Matsuno stopped coming to work in protest. And so they put a new director on the game who just kind of finished the game with the outline. And you can tell, dude. You can tell when Matsuno left because all of a sudden, you know, it's just kind of like going through the standard fare. It's just not as not as good as it was in the first half. But that first half is just masterpiece. Oh, yeah. It's one of the best. Yeah. yeah. So definitely a good pick. I'm not going to lie. I, I picked a few. I'm sorry. That's, a, that's fine. I had two. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what. I spent an entire summer playing Final Fantasy VII as a kid. Mm. Me and my best friend around the corner, his name was Evan, and me and him had this kind of adversarial relationship when it came to video games because he was really into Nintendo 64 and I was a PlayStation guy. And we were constantly like, oh, which one's better? 
But man, when I got Final Fantasy VII, he would just come over to my house and we would just play that thing for like 10 hours a day, dude. And there's like, I mean, nowadays you have games like Red Dead Redemption where you can just do practically anything. But back then, that game was just so mind-blowing. And I still think it holds up today because there's so much extra stuff that you can do that's still fun today. First off, in terms of replay value, depending on the types of characters that you have in your party, you're going to get different dialogue options. Mm -hmm. So usually people kind of stick with their original lineup and you'll still get dialogue with the other characters that you don't choose. There's going to be other dialogue that you're going to miss out on if you don't have Barrett, for example, in your party through the entire game. So you can replay the game and put those other characters in your party and have a new experience. You know, if you have a party with Vincent Newfie, or if you have with Kate Sith and Sid, you know, you're going to have different dialogue options. I think for replayability, just having those multiple characters adds a lot, but also with the extra content. There's a lot of fluff in Final Fantasy VII, but I would say the Chocobo racing in particular, that is actually a fun mini game. Okay. <laughs> I, I spent many hours playing that mini game, and I still, when I replay the game, will do a handful of races. I was really happy when they kind of brought that back with Final Fantasy 15. That was a good mini game. I liked it a lot. Your experience with it really depends on like what you're trying to do because a lot of people are playing the game with a guide and they're just like, I want Knights of the Round. I want the best summon. Yeah. What do I have to do to get it? And it's like, oh, I have to play this Chocobo mini game. Well, to do and to get a gold Chocobo. Mm -hmm. and, if, and they're like, okay, what are the fastest possible steps to get the gold Chocobo? And then, then you have to do the races and you're just like counting the races. Like right. how many more of these do I have to do? Whereas w a lot of us, when we played it, when we were younger, we didn't have a guide or it was like a very crude guide. Maybe that mm -hmm. didn't have the best information. And so you were playing the mini game to play the game, but you didn't know like exactly what Chocobo you had to breed with exactly what color, you know, to get the next step that will eventually get you to the gold one. Right, you know, right. So you were more so playing the mini game for the game with the hopes of like the eventual progress towards the gold one versus you know exactly what you need to do to get to the gold Chocobo. So you're like following a checklist. And when you're following a checklist, then it, then the, I think the becomes race monotonous. Becomes, very, becomes very tedious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the context of the question, <clears throat> right? Because when you're a kid again, you don't have a lot of games. What game mm -hmm. can you just play? And for me, that like I totally resonate with that because. Dude, my allowance, my parents were cheap, man. I'd get like $2 a week, you know? Yeah. How many games am I buying? Not that many. <laughs> you know, it would take a long time for me to save up. So I, when I got Final Fantasy VII, I just played the crap out of that. And we would, uh, you know, me and my, my buddy, we would just sit there and race chocobos. And the chocobo breeding in particular, while I do find that to, not to be that fun, you know, there, there's a lot of, reward with that because if you get the the different types of chocobos you can explore different parts of the map and it opens up different areas and stuff like that so those kind of extra elements i think added a lot and also obviously just the weapons the the mini like optional bosses at the end of the game those are a lot of fun to try to challenge yourself i mean you can buy a house in final fantasy 7 <laughs> i remember i that was the most anticlimactic thing ever i saved up to buy that 250,000 gil house and then they were like okay it's yours and then i just kind of like slept in it in the bed that, that's it yeah <laughs> but when i was a kid i was like this is my house yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> but you know th there was a lot of cool stuff with upgrading your materia it was always very satisfying to master the materia and so i think just the culmination of just the mini games the end bosses all the optional story content i mean you have Yuffie and Vincent that are optional, you know, just the different dialogue options that you have with who you choose to be in your party. I think that that game could easily last you a long time. That's a good pick. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to move on to my next one? Yeah. You said you had a few more. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So Fire Emblem Three Houses. Oh, oh yeah. Replay value, right? Oh yeah. So yeah. It's kind of funny because this game leading up to the game launch, I was certain it was going to suck. <laughs> I was just not impressed. I mean, there was very little marketing push, which made me think that they were trying to save money with the launch. Like, oh, they knew it was going to suck. So they didn't spend a lot of time marketing it the way that it should be. 
you know, compared to other games that were launching on the Switch. And then on top of that, every time they released something, hardcore Fire Emblem fans were freaking pissed, whether it was, oh, the Persona elements, or they'd be mad about something they showed with the combat, or, you know, the, the trailers they were releasing were like the worst trailers, because they would take these scenes out of context that would make it seem like it had tremendously horrible dialogue. And so I was just looking at this game and I, was, I thought, this is going to be a train wreck. This is not going to be a good game. And I remember claiming on our podcast that if this game gets a nine, and I thought that was like impossible, I thought this game gets a nine out of 10 from like several outlets, I will, I will buy the game. And I thought that was my get out of jail free card. Like I'm like, oh, don't have to worry about covering this game, you know? <laughs> and then it came out, it was getting like 9.5s out of 10. I was like, oh, oh crap yeah but i picked it up dude and it's a fantastic game it's a it's a it just sucked me in and i spent an embarrassing amount of time in this game more so than i want to acknowledge but like <laughs> like you pointed out there's three different houses to the game so that's really three different story variations that you can choose from and then if you get the centered shadows dlc you're going to have a whole nother house that you can experiment with so that's a lot of variation with the story and then just like final fantasy 7 except even more so depending on your party lineup who you're able to recruit to your team you're able to get a lot more of those persona-esque like story elements that people really like and so the more time you put into it the more unique your experience is going to be with the game and so i think that this would be an easy pick for just devoting 100 hours 150 hours into it easily not to mention the gameplay loop for the battles that's like the biggest hook for me because those battles are just so engrossing I, did you ever end up playing the game three houses i haven't played it yet oh, it's stand. over there i have it but i just haven't had the time it is kind of daunting because like you know you're gonna sink so much time into it yeah but it's so fun yeah like i want to i want to play it when i have nothing else going on <laughs> you know just so i can well, it's focus a, on it. Yeah, it's a good game that you can kind of pick up for like 10 hours, maybe not in one sitting, but obviously play it over a week, mm -hmm. put 10 or 12 hours into it, put it down, come back to it. But this was basically the first Fire Emblem game that I really got into. I mm -hmm. played some other ones, but this was the first one where I like went full hog on it. It's really the, I think the upgrade loop from, mm -hmm. you know, upgrading your characters, changing <laughs> their class, take them to school and teach them different things. And then you go implement these new abilities, these new classes in battle. It allows you to reverse actions and try a different, different route. And so there's a lot of strategy, the battles that are really engaging. And man, these battles take a long time. I mean, some of them will take 30, 40 minutes. And then if you get the Centered Shadows DLC, the battles are even longer. <laughs> you know, they'll take like an hour. Yeah. And they really amped up the difficulty on that as well. So you'll be playing a lot of those battles over again, but it's a good time, man. It's got great music, great characters, a pretty enjoyable story. You like persona elements that's in there. And I think that, you know, people can spend hundreds of hours in this game easily. So definitely would throw that out there. And last game, but not least persona five. Mm -hmm. Speaking of persona. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you like persona elements, you're really going to like them in this game. <laughs> but yeah, Persona 5, I'm not the biggest Persona 4 fan, so I didn't pick up Persona 5 at launch, but I did pick up Persona 5, the Royal Edition, and I haven't beaten the game because it's so freaking long, but I'm working on it, you know, routinely, sparingly in my, when I do have free time, and I've really enjoyed what I've played. It's a really well-built game. I've talked about it before, so I'm not going to go through the whole list of things that I do like with the game, but I, I just think the, the biggest thing they do well with this is the more time you spend into it, just like Fire Emblem, but even better with this, the more time you spend with the game, the closer you're going to get to those characters, the more unique it's going to feel to your playthrough. And so when you do finish that game, it does feel like, okay, I had a unique experience. Somebody else did not have that experience and therefore it feels more special. And there's people online that have spent 800 hours in this game. And they still haven't beaten it. So it's definitely a game that you can put a lot of hours into. And on that point, if you are you familiar with the YouTuber, The Completionist? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So yeah. he's this he's this YouTuber. He does these video series where he 100% entire games. So that means all the story variations. He gets every item you can get in the game. He gets max quantity, 99 of all the... He does the whole nine yards and he, and he kind of creates a vlog, if you will, of, of that journey. I mean, they're very polished videos. So I shouldn't say vlog, but go check out the channel. But he did Persona 5 and people brought up, hey man, why are you doing this game f three years after it came out? And he said, no, I bought it on launch day. I've been playing it for three years. That's how long it took. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he was like, this is the only game that I tapped. I technically did not 100% complete the game. But he, his basic point was, <laughs> I feel that I did more than most people, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he ended up loving it too. But it was a very entertaining video to go watch. So uh, definitely go check that out. But honestly, as a 32-year-old man, I got a career. I got this RPG podcast. I got personal life. Persona 5 is a very daunting game to get mm -hmm. into but i've enjoyed my time with it and i think that as a kid if you just have three months off to just spend 12 hours a day playing video games this could be a black hole that could just suck you in like For no sure. other so <laughs> yeah so um that's that's basically what i got with that i know if eric was here he'd bring up final fantasy 14 which of course that would also be a good pick yeah, you know, Dra uh, Dragon Quest Twelve probably as well. I think that's at least Dragon Quest Twelve. Eleven, sorry, <laughs> eleven. I'm getting ahead of myself. Stands uh, on, on our yeah. podcast leaking information. <laughs> <laughs> Dragon <laughs> Dragon Quest Eleven, right? Because that's got um, kind of like three arcs to it and is pretty lengthy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all in all, really good picks. I mean, I. I, I, I got to admit, I should have picked Final Fantasy XII. All right. Yeah. It's not as, it. there's not as much in that as there is in um, the games you mentioned, Persona 5 and Fire Emblem Three Houses. That That's, but it's, there's still quite a bit of content. Dude, I spent a lot of time with those hunts. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, yeah. of, there, there is a lot of stuff you can do with that and the, the different gambit setups and stuff like that. So definitely a good pick. Mm -hmm. But let's move on to our next question we got from Hyconic, who says, which RPG franchises do you think are good, but flying under the radar? So we've gotten similar questions to this, but not quite in this context before. So we're going to slightly modify this a little bit. And we're going to pick RPGs that are, we feel are flying under the radar and that are good, but are still being developed. So yeah. We're not going to pick games that we may have talked about in the past that have been lost to time because, you know, the company went out of business or something like that. We're talking about things that are still in development today. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of franchises that are finished or dormant, you know, that, that <laughs> show no signs of life that are really good, you know? Yeah. But it, it's it's harder when you're trying to pick a franchise that's still being released at least semi regularly that you think is flying under the radar. So for me, if you asked this question like two or three years ago, I would have said um, the Trail series from Falcom. Mm -hmm. But I think now um, the word has kind of gotten out, and the people who like those games have have found them. You know, right? The uh, right. The, the Falcom uh, Internet Army, Army yeah, has has gone out and recruited many many loyal followers. <laughs> they've they've landed on the beaches. Yeah, and part of that is because ground. the game the games have been ported to Switch and to PC, so now a lot of people just have access to them. But where before they were, um, like PC and uh, Sony consoles, the PSP had the first the first games the uh, Trails in the Sky games, and then PS3, PS4 was the Cold Steel games. But now they're they're all they're all out there. You can get them on many devices. So that would have been the pick two or three years ago. Now I'm actually going to pick the other <laughs> Falcom main series that they okay. work on, which is the right here. This is the latest one. Uh, ease nine. Ease nine. It looks like it looks like wise, but it's pronounced ease. And that's a franchise that I just recently 
got into. I hadn't really played any, and I played um, the PS Vita version, Memories of Celsetta, and I thought it was like decent. Like this is like a solid like eight out of ten game. And then I randomly picked up Ease Eight on a on a discount, uh, like on a sale, mm-hmm. and started playing that game. And that game just like really impressed me. Ease like, Eight. Eight, number eight. Okay. Yeah. If you were going to jump in, although I have not, I have the game, but I have not had a chance to play it yet. I also hear nine is very good, but eight was um, like really, really good. And it may be because I got it at a discount. I didn't pay full $60 for it, yeah. but it was so good. It made me want to pick this one up new to support the company to, you know, to support oh, wow. Falcom. So although I haven't, I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but. And then I was looking into the the company more, Falcom, Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize, but they're a small team um, for for game development, that is. um, Yeah. According to Wikipedia, they have 62 employees total in the company. Which gives total context to why their games take forever to get translated and come out to the West. They don't have an in-house translation team. They they have to work Mm -hmm. with a partner um it was xseed before now it's nis um but like for context um we were talking about um fire emblem which is developed by uh intelligent systems just for comparison uh again according to wikipedia they have 178 employees oh wow and falcom has 62 yeah and i and i feel like in terms of quality though they're not too far off right mm-hmm. from from like those games like they're they're pretty close but they're doing it on a much tighter budget and less manpower well sometimes you know? with and i don't want to detract from your point because it's well taken that less people less you know it, it, it's very difficult to to put out the same product right the same quality but i think sometimes when you have a little bit of a smaller team size it does help that it's a little bit easier to manage in mm, terms of yeah. the vision for the game. So everyone's on the same page, you know, mm-hmm. someone who's in charge of the project, it's easier for them to look over the game. When I look at games such as cyberpunk, for example, I mean, they had like 2000 people working on that game. Yeah. And then you're like, people are getting mad at the director, you know, like, mm-hmm. is this guy walking around all 2000 people? I mean, there's, you right. know, and it does still fall on him, but anyways, go back to you, your point. Yeah. So that was just a, point of comparison because i thought like who's who's a uh like um kind of a a developer of like equal standing in terms of like the quality of their games and in my opinion like intelligent systems who makes the fire emblem and the paper mario games they're they're pretty comparable so then i looked up how many employees they have and it's like wow they have almost triple (laughs) the number of employees that falcom has so that to me just makes it like even more impressive although you're right less employees sometimes sometimes you have too many people it's kind of like a too many cooks in the kitchen situation or right things can get bloated if you don't have yeah, good exactly management. yeah B- but yeah that's um that would be my pick although i don't know i don't know how well this game sold um, so yeah it could be i'm just totally wrong and like the cat is already out of the bag and this is no longer an overlooked franchise franchise but i i was looking like relative to the other g- series that are still being made i mean this is these are quality games but they're nowhere near selling dragon quest numbers or um you know even persona like persona is selling way better than than these falcom games but i think they're really good so that's that's the difficult thing though when you talk about not on the radar because We do an RPG podcast, so there's games and series that are very much on my radar, even series I don't play that often, but I'm just see them in the conversation a lot because, you know, we're constantly looking for news and other big things happening in the RPG space. We're affiliated with RPG fan. They're our media partners, so we also see things that they're doing. And so we're a little bit more in the know, I think, whereas sometimes I think people that are more casual RPG gamers they may not be, that might not be on their radar as much as something like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy. I remember one episode we were talking about Tales of Arise 
And I was talking about the game coming out and I was excited for it. We were showing some video, some footage of the, the trailer and somebody in the comments remarked, thanks for putting this on my radar. I had no idea it was coming out. And I remember yeah. thinking, oh, wow, you know, and I'm not throwing shade on that person. I'm glad they kind of let us know because sometimes I think, oh, you know, we've already talked about this game enough. People already know about it. Right. But, you know, it, if you're really in RPGs, that I'm sure the East series is on your radar, you know. Right, right, right. But yeah. Well, to the general public, it's not. Yeah, for for us, like the Tales franchise, that's like in terms of AAA, on the radar, yeah. in the on the radar, <laughs> that's like in the top five, right? Right. It's like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, um, Persona, Tales, Pokemon, I guess, right? Or so, yeah, something like that. We might be able to rearrange it if we sat there and thought about it. But yeah, it's oh, like in order, yeah. But those are like the the top five. So yeah, it is interesting that it depends on your perspective. It depends on how 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 low your ear is to the ground right regarding right. news yeah right exactly so i'll say something on ease eight real quick i've i played that game a little bit and okay. I, so if people want to try it out i'm gonna throw a wild option at them but it's a, a cheap option so some of my friends from when i was in the military they're not really big gamers they don't have consoles and stuff like that but i visited them over the fourth of july and they were like oh hat you got to get on this stadia and i was <laughs> like mm, oh, oh dear <laughs> i don't think i do you know that's what i was yeah. thinking but <laughs> but they were like all in love with it and i'm sorry if i sneeze okay, i think i'm good yeah. let, me, let me drink some of this coffee here real quick all right, I'm Google working, stadia i'm working yeah. through it okay Okay, so they're trying to get me into Stadia, and so over a period of a couple of days, they kind of talked me into like, okay, I'll try it when I have time, because they were all on it, and they are on the voice chat, and they are playing things like PUBG and stuff like that, and I, I thought, okay, this might be, I, I could just pop on there every now and again, and once I researched it more, you know, it was very simple for me to get in on a game, and I just opened up Chrome like a browser went to Stadia's website and I was playing a game in five minutes and they let you play any game. They will, they don't let you play any game for free, but they'll let you play games for 30 minutes for free a mm. day. Or if you pay nine 99 a month, you can play as much as you want with full resolution. But with that monthly fee, they'll give you free games as well. So the first month they gave me 12 free games. And then after that, I think you get a couple of games a month and I have really good internet, and so it, I could tell with certain games that I was streaming it, but by and large, I mostly forgot, and so one of the free games that I got was East 8, and so I played nice. that for a little bit, because I just wanted to try the game out with, like, a an action mm. game, right? Because that's going to be where it really shows, I think, and so it, it played really well, and I, I was impressed with what I played, and it was of high quality, so if but I still have to play more of it to give a, a full opinion on it. But if you guys want to try that game out, that might be an option, you know, just grab your crappy laptop, get on Google Chrome, go to Stadia and, and plug in an Xbox controller. So I didn't buy the hundred dollar device. I just plugged in an Xbox controller and it read the buttons and, and picked it up and played it. So that's a good way to play it for, for cheap. If you don't have any other yeah. options. And yeah, quick, it doesn't matter. Demo. Doesn't matter your hardware because it's run on internet. So just thought I'd throw that yeah. out there. Yeah, that's a good that's a good option to at least try it out. I know Eric played it recently too, and he was saying, you know, it's he doesn't it's a like good, he didn't like Falcon games before, but he liked this one. He liked these eight, yeah. And it's because it has that um uh kind of exploration dynamic going to it. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um yeah, it's because you 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 gain more equipment and and get more options as you explore the the island yeah yeah for sure so. so with me i was again trying to think of a game that's currently in development that's under the radar and i maybe i was thinking too much into it like we we're talking about because to me if the game's still getting released like they're like the developer felt like it was reasonable to create follow ups that meant there was a fan base and if there's a fan base and it's on the radar 
you know, so I was feeling really challenged with trying to come up with, you know, a very under the radar RPG franchise that has multiple games that, that are still in development. But I liked the direction we were going with it because we wanted to pick something new. So I'm going to slightly alter this just for my picks because I can. <laughs> and I'm going to pick uh, RPG games that may not be a franchise, but that have come out recently that are probably going to have follow ups that may have gotten some notoriety. But I think in terms of sales, in terms of the conversation, I think that they deserve to be like much more in the conversation, you know, so didn't sell millions of copies. Yeah. That type of thing. But again, are games that did get some recognition. So I picked, I, I picked two games. So the first one I, I would pick is 13 Sentinels, Agus Rim, mm. which yeah. again, this game made a lot of waves in the visual novel video game space. But I don't think it's it didn't sell five million copies. You know, it's not hitting the persona sales or anything like that. I think it sold like a little bit under a million, which was amazing for that style of game. But I think mm -hmm. that this specific game deserves to be recognized a lot more. And if you're unaware, it's made by Vanillaware, which is most well known for Odin Sphere, the 2D side scroller. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really play like Odin Sphere at all, but it does have the similar gorgeous graphics. But it's a visual novel that has a lot of interactivity, a lot of game elements that are put into it. I usually don't like visual novels because the few that I've played, it just consists of me pressing X. Yeah. Choose your own, choose your own adventure book kind of thing. Yeah. Except a lot of them don't even let you choose your own adventure. You just press X with like a dialogue <laughs> box and like it'll have images that change. And, yeah. And so they're good stories. It's just, God, I'm getting tired of just pressing X. Just, is there an auto X on this? So I don't even have to, I just want to watch it. I don't want to press yeah, yeah. X, you know? <laughs> and so, and it's kind of weird too, because you can technically just go on YouTube and watch a let's play of it, you know? And it's like, then you don't have to buy the, the game, you know, because mm -hmm. there's nothing else to do in a, a lot of them. But with this game, 13 Sentinels, they added a lot to that formula to make it different. So number one, they added an RTS element to the formula. So there's these mech strategy battles that you can do that'll break up the story. And, you know, you move your mechs around uh, around the map and you upgrade characters and level them up and upgrade their, their gear and stuff like that. So there's that RPG element that gives that itch that, that you want from a, from a good RPG. You know, I wouldn't put the strategy on, on, on the same level with Fire Emblem Three Houses in terms mm -hmm. of enjoyability, but it is a good break from the story. But what really kills it for me with this is the story itself. Now, again, it's not you just pressing X, like you move characters around this, the scene, you can investigate clues on the map. Also, there's different dialogue options and things like that that allow different variety for you to actually interact with the world as opposed to just pressing X. So it is good in that regard. It's a science fiction story and it centers around a cast of characters that you have to choose each one of them to learn their backstory and it's crazy how wildly different some of these characters are. I mean, some of them, their stories take place in the past. Some of them are in the future. They're slowly intertwining and, and coming together as you learn more about them. But I cannot understate how good these stories are. When you're going through them, you will get so invested into a character's story. And then it just cuts you off on a cliffhanger. And it'll say that you can't proceed any further with that character's story until you go try out a different character story and make progress on that story so you can learn something else. And then that character will get cut off. And it's crazy because this game has kept me up to like two o'clock in the morning because I'm just <laughs> trying to get back to that one character that I was really interested in. But then I got really invested in this other character, trying to get to this other character. And it's just, it's so good. The story is so good. And I was really surprised. This isn't a game that I would have bought because I have that bias towards visual novels, but RPG fan, our media partner, they needed someone to record game footage for them for their video review on their YouTube channel. So definitely go check that out. Check out the review. It's really good. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll record footage for it. And I wasn't even sure like what type of game this was. And I got the game like almost two months before it came out. 
Wow. Yeah, so it was crazy. I was like halfway through the game by the time the game by the time the game was <laughs> launched. And I feel so stupid for not talking about the game more because it was a good opportunity, but I wasn't sure what the interest level was for it. But it's just it, it was it was a great experience. And I know a lot of people have talked about this game and people that are fans of visual novels, they really hold this one up to be something really truly special. But I think this type of game really kind of overlaps with other types of games where if you're not really into visual novels you can try this out because it has a lot of those rpg elements in it and it has more interactivity with it and i would just say that give it a shot the first half hour or so is a little slow but once you get into the pacing of the game it can, it can be a, a lot of fun and man that story will just it'll keep you up late so definitely definitely check that out yeah, I think that's a that's a good pick and not one that you think of right away because they uh the vanillaware games they don't um make sequels to their games typically. Mm -hmm. Like all the games they make are one off of that. Yeah, of that they're of that similar style, although maybe not so much in the visual novel. Like you said Odin Sphere is more of a a beat 'em up <laughs> right. like a traditional 2D beat 'em up game. But they have a very similar art style, but then each game moves on to a new story, new world, new concept. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have like a franchise. They're, right. just, they're, they're doing a different game every time. And so that is a very easy way for those kind of games to fall under the radar because if the new one is not anywhere near 14 Sentinels. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Do you think we'll get a, a sequel 13 sentinels sequel or will it just be a new concept like they normally do to be honest i'm not sure mm -hmm. i i it's hard to say because and maybe i haven't followed up with the news on this maybe there's been some kind of rumblings about that but you know i i this game in particular has gotten some attention i think and I, so i think that from a business perspective it would be stupid not to, not do, to do a sequel yeah of some sort but Again, what do I know? You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that hasn't been their track record so far, but right. yeah, I wonder if that will, will change with the success of this game. Yeah. And then the other game I want to talk about is a game that has gotten some attention, a good amount of attention, but I think deserves even more is Transistor. Now it's made by Supergiant Games. Their newest game, Hades, has gotten a lot of attention. Prior to that, it was Transistor. And again, I'm fully cognizant of the fact that in 2014 when transistor came out it was nominated for best independent game and best score soundtrack at the game awards it didn't win ign picked it for the best artwork of 2014 i kind of feel like transistor was that game that was it came out it didn't sell 8 million copies people kind of liked it a lot of people didn't play it and then it just kind of stopped appearing in the conversation man this game's amazing okay stylistically if you're not aware, it's got this like cyberpunk kind of atmosphere. You can kind of think something along the lines of Blade Runner with some more anime styled graphics. Have you played this game, by the way? Not for very long and a long time ago, but I remember visually what it looks like, what you're talking about. And it kind of has camera angle, like isometric view. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of the right game. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, yeah, kind of an isometric top down view. Everything about the game just kind of works hand in hand with the game. So like I said, the graphics are kind of like cyberpunk anime ish, but kind of slight anime. So it's not over the top. The soundtrack has kind of a jazz vibe to it that matches the aesthetic of the world. It works really well. I mean, the main character, she's this woman named red who comes in contact with this guy whose conscience has been downloaded into this sword. This is a cyberpunk world guys. Yeah. So his <laughs> conscience, his conscience has been downloaded into the sword and so she, the sword talks to her and the whole game is about her relationship basically with this character. There's a backdrop with like the, this group that's after them and this city politics and everything. And it is an RPG, but it's all a backdrop to this relationship that she has with this, this character who's been downloaded into the sword. And I think that was so genius because a good video game narrative uses gameplay to accent the story. And because this person's conscience is in the sword that she's using, there's a lot of gameplay story ideas that are intertwined. It just works 
beautifully. I, I'm just very impressed with what I've seen with this game. And just even the world building is so well done. It's so subtle. There's not, as you know, dialogue. So as an example, the main character, Red, she's a singer. The game doesn't tell you outright that, oh, hey, Red, you're a singer. You know, Red already knows she's a singer, but it shows you that she's a singer because you're walking down an alleyway and she stops and looks at a poster with her on the wall and the sword talks about it a little bit like, oh, there you are, that type of thing. It's not in your face. It's not awkward. The game just oozes style in a way that a lot of games don't do. And I, I really think that this type of game or this specific game in particular, 10, 15 years from now, people are going to talk about, you know, hidden gems. I think that people are going to talk about Transistor a lot more because right now everyone's talking about Hades, talking about, oh man, Hades is, is, is great. And, you know, it is great, but Transistor is awesome. I highly recommend it. I think that it should be more much more in the conversation today. I wish more games would take some inspiration from that. And uh, I think it's a a game that was recognized when it came out, but has been kind of overshadowed by Hades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. So anyways, should we should we carry on with our last question? Or is there anything else you want to bring up with a oh. off the radar game? Oh. No, those are good picks. Yeah. All right. So Zach Attack, he asks, what's an RPG series you haven't played yet for those series? Is there a plan to play them in the future? If not, why not? So I guess you want me to just start off or do you want to go? You can go. Sure. All right. So I'm just going to come out right with it. Legend of Heroes and Trails in the Sky games. Mm. You know, I played the first one for a few hours. I streamed it on this channel. If you guys want to check that out. A lot of people seem to have liked that. I don't know why, because I spent, of the three hours I played it, I think I spent 20 minutes trying to find this building on the map that was clearly identified on the map. It was a blue building, <laughs> but I kept thinking it was a water, right? Oh. <laughs> so, like, people were like, it's right there. And I was like, I can't find it, you know? <laughs> and that's all the joys of streaming it live, you know? But anyways... Yeah. So I, I, but I really liked what I played. I thought the world building was great, but I only played a couple hours of it. And so I guess technically when you say I haven't played, I've, I've technically played that first one. Uh, I think it was Legend of Heroes, the first one. And, yeah. but I, I, there's so many of those games and I, I didn't really, I haven't really dove in first or further like I intended to. And that's honestly, I don't have a lot of spare time these days. So any RPG that I am playing it's usually based on what this podcast requires because I want to talk about it, you know, so I'm going to play mm -hmm. that over something else in the past and any of the other games like Transistor. I just played that because it was convenient to play. I could download it on my switch and I could play it for like 10 or 20 minutes while I'm trying to pass out at night. And so it's convenient in that regard. And I don't believe Legend of Heroes, the first game is on switch. I think no, uh, the Sky Games. I don't believe they are yet, not yet. I think they got uh, like the Cold Steel games. Yeah, the, Cold, the Steel Cold Steel games, games on there. On there, yeah. but from what I understand, those games you can still play if you haven't played the other games. But most people are like, no, it's a thousand times better if you played the other games. So I haven't picked those up for that reason. So mm, yeah, you know, I think that this is just one of those things where I have to have a good reason that play it and that would be for the podcast i could play it but you know when it comes to video game discussions eric tried the first one he can't stand it and so <laughs> just we've i've tried to i've tried to insert it into the the you know hat of games we could possibly talk about for this podcast but you know we have this veto rule where one of us can veto one of the games and eric just vetoes that real quick every time yeah <laughs> so He's so it's just uh it's one of those things, but eventually I'm gonna get to it. So I you know I just need a good excuse. But yeah, they are they are long games and very um like they'll have long sections of like dialogue, no gameplay, <laughs> kind of, and then and then other long sections of like a dungeon, less a lot less dialogue or story, I guess you could say. So they they are, I think they are not good games for playing in like 20 minute 
bursts before bed, you know, <laughs> like you're saying. So they, they, they require more investment and then they are kind of like a slow burn sometimes. But that's the, that's the thing. Like I can see that from what I played, I could see how much attention of detail was put into the world building itself, how much attention was being put into the characters. And so when people say that it's a slow burn, but it pays off and then you just get hooked at one point, I totally see it. I can see where it's coming from. So yeah. that makes me want to play it more. I just, I just need a good reason. And I've been thinking about it. You know, the first game came out on PSP and I got a mini retro emulator handheld that runs PSP games generally pretty well. And so I put that game on there as just like a test case. And I was kind of playing it a little bit just to see how, and it ran pretty well. So maybe that might be an opportunity for me to play that with some save states and stuff like that. So maybe I will give that a shot. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, an option. That is a lot of time to devote, to get into it though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if it's good, it's good. You know, but what's, what's your, True. what's your pick? Uh, for me, I, I, I thought about like, well, what's the, the big kind of well-known JRPGs that I haven't played. And actually, I think Breath of Fire is probably the biggest one mm. that I've just, I've never played any of them. And I'm trying to think about why that is. And I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> but Because like I, I had a Super Nintendo and the first two games are on the Super Nintendo. And I had a PlayStation. And the three and four are on the PlayStation. I think Breath of Fire never... 1 and 2 are currently on Nintendo Switch Online for I mean, you got to pay the three dollars, oh, yeah, some a, three dollars a month or whatever it is. But yeah, it's yeah. I there. just, I just never got into them. I think maybe I was just so focused on Final Fantasy and Square Enix's other games at the time, like during those two consoles that, and and being younger and not having that much disposable income, which ties back to our <laughs> first question. But yeah. yeah, I just never got into it. Um, I do have plans to play them someday because I think it's. I should, you know, just because it's a um, pretty iconic JRPG franchise, I should at least give them a try. And from what I understand, number three is the best one as far as like people, what I what I hear people talking about the series. They That's talk the about number PlayStation three. one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's being really, really good. So yeah. I definitely need to give it a try at some point. Yeah. It's just kind of a blind spot, like a... <laughs> JRPG blind spot I have. I think everybody has some of those games, you know, that for whatever reason, they just, they're classic games, but they just never give them a shot. Breath of Fire is definitely that for me. Yeah. So Breath of the Fire 1 and 2, I'm just going to forewarn you, don't start with those. Well, they have some dated systems in there, dated mechanics. Yeah, and the story's pretty generic, and it's not, it's not as good as the other games on that system yeah. so definitely maybe try breath of fire 3 once you give it a go because the, the I, I tried with one and two and you know as a kid i was trying it and i got decently far in both of those before i just gave up and if it was generic for my 13 year old brain it was it was definitely <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite <laughs> if generic, you tried yeah. it now i've seen some later reviews from people that never played those games and went back and hit or miss, but a lot of people are like, I don't really like this as much as some of you guys that are suggesting it, but you know, breath of the fire three is a much, much better game. So that'll be the one I have to start with then. But fortunately those are the only games that we haven't played. We've played all the other RPG games known. (laughs) There's no other ones. Yeah, including all these, the ones uh, only released in Japan, right? That we never heard of. No, I've played all those <laughs> Japanese only. Read, okay. a, read a Game Facts article for the translation. Done, <laughs> done the whole nine yards. So only these last ones in, in the in the series. Just joking. But anyways, I'm sure there's a lot of other games that we could talk about on this, but I thought that was kind of an interesting way to close out this podcast, given, you know, before with the previous question from... Uh, who was it? Hyconic, I think it was. Who asked yeah, about, about games under the radar? Yeah, games under the radar that we would suggest, and then games that we haven't played that we would recommend or we would we would want to try but haven't. So, mm-hmm. but all right. So that's going to wrap us up for this week's podcast. 
Thank you to everyone that contributed a question. There are still some other ones out there that we'll pick on another podcast. If you want to contribute your question, there will be a link in our description on the audio version and the video that will allow you to join our Discord server. And you can go on there, you can chat with us, you can ask questions. And next time we have a question episode, we'll hopefully pick your question. If not, we'll get to it eventually. Thank you again for checking us, checking us out, and we will catch you all next week. Thank you, guys. See you next time. See ya. Hey, thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And also, check out our audio version. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and practically any podcatcher you can think of. Also, we have a fantastic media partner at RPGFan.com. Be sure to go check them out for your latest RPG reviews and news, as well as some other kick-ass podcasts with Rhythm Encounter, Retro Encounter, and Random Encounter. Go check them out. We'll see you next time.